The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, June 7, 2023, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. I'll be your host today. I am joined by Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. I'm looking forward to our conversation today as we dive in and you answer the question, is the easy disinflation over? We have the FOMC meeting next week, and today we want to take a closer look at inflation and the underlying dynamics as these price pressures continue. Supply chain has begun to normalize, but let's start off by looking at trucking. Uh, trucking rates, prices sky high during the pandemic, but even though they've come down, are pressures starting to return? Yeah, and, and this is kind of the crazy part, right? And, and we say it, and it's almost like beating a dead horse, but the pricing pressures and the oddities coming out of COVID are pretty incredible, right? So it, it kind of coming into COVID, we had seen, you know, relatively normal trucking prices. It really wasn't that expensive. Um, and it was just kind of trending sideways, like it typically does. You know, volumes are, you know, relatively stable. You know, they don't tend to jump around. There's some seasonality, but whatever. And then all of a sudden we got into COVID and trucking just absolutely collapsed in terms of rates. And then all of a sudden we didn't have things on the shelves. Everybody was double and triple ordering to try to get toilet paper and, all sorts of other basic necessities back onto grocery store shelves. And guess what? When you over order, that has a huge effect on freight rates and trucking rates. And that's that it just absolutely skyrocketed during COVID. And now we've kind of kind of come to the other side of it where you've seen, you know, you call it 50, 60 percent declines from the peaks in different regions. And now it's begun to stabilize and even move up a little bit. You know, some of that's probably seasonality. But again, you've really had these retailers working through their inventories. And now all of a sudden, you know, there's a little bit of a, hmm, do we need to, you know, order a little bit more? Do we need more on the shelves? And I think you're beginning to see some of that freight disinflation begin to wane and probably chop sideways. So in kind of in terms of getting back to the question, is the easy deflation or disinflation over, you know, at least here it appears that it's going to be a little more difficult to, put freight, to push freight prices down meaningfully more from here. And what's the importance of, you touched on earlier, delivery times? What does it signal about the status of the supply chain? Yeah, so it's, it signals that the supply chain is pretty much healed. Uh, when, you have, so when you have delivery times that have just fallen off a cliff, and, you know, you can just get it delivered now, uh, that's, an, that's a signal that the supply chain is pretty much already there. In other words, you know, we fixed that inflation problem and we probably overshot a little bit to the downside. And once you have to put these inventories back on shelves, guess what? Yeah, again, you're going to begin to have these upward pricing pressures and upward shifts in delivery times just because that's the way it works, right? When you have a lot of orders, it's going to be, a, it's going to change the story and narrative a little bit here and you've had it fall off a cliff. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's somewhat persistent, you know, maybe it just chops sideways from here, but at some point, you know, it's going to continue, it's going to probably normalize and that means maybe moving higher from here. So again, that, that easy part of the disinflation is, is probably behind us. If we take a look at air freight, it tends to be expensive and associated with very high value goods, but can it be used to circumvent those crowded ports? Is, are the ports still very crowded? So, so the ports really aren't that crowded. Uh, we did see uh, Long Beach, uh, North, uh, North Carolina, Long Beach, California. Uh, we did see a strike there that may back it up a little bit, but it's not going to be anywhere near what we saw during the COVID period when you, know, you had ships floating around uh, off the coast of California for months on end before they could be unloaded. You know, we haven't really seen that. But yeah, freight, air freight in particular was one way to get around those port issues where you could fly in 
your semiconductors and other you know, computers very high value add goods that it made sense to pay a little bit more for because you had a, a higher rate of gross margin on them so you could take a little bit of a hit there uh, to have stuff on the shelves but again you're beginning to see this really come back down and you've seen it normalize to levels that are pretty close to pre-COVID I mean you could continue to see some declines but uh, you're, you haven't uh, returned to the same number of flights, uh, particularly on the international front, uh, as we did as we had pre-COVID, and you know, that that limits the number of planes you can put stuff on uh, to cross the Atlantic or the Pacific. So you're probably going to see these rates maybe decline slightly, but stabilize as we move forward. And one item that has been in the headlines throughout the last year: egg prices. We're all happy egg prices have finally come down, but that's also not the case for proteins. If you look at chicken or beef, they've been hit hard by many factors. Can you take a minute to update us on those two pieces? Sure. So this is this is one of those crazy things where, you know, you look at the price of milk and eggs. Those are the two things that in the grocery store people really fixate on uh, because they're things that you buy with a significant amount of frequency. Uh, so on the eggs front, everybody kind of knows what happened there, right? You had uh, bird flu and you had to cull a significant amount of uh, chickens, right? And then you had to replenish those layers uh, and you had to try to do it rather quickly, right? Those egg prices were astronomical. So there was a significant incentive uh, to get those layers back up and running. Uh, the problem there being that when you have chickens to become layers and not chickens to uh, become chicken tenders, uh, you begin to have kind of a, a little bit of a pricing distortion. Now that will that will mitigate itself, you know, over time. You know, chickens are a rather quick fix uh, when it comes to the protein side, but when it comes to ground beef, it's a completely different story. Uh, ground beef is is probably one of the places where you're going to see a significant amount of uh, pricing pressure as we kind of continue to move forward uh, for a number of reasons. One being droughts in places where cattle uh, herds are prevalent, uh, and another one being that you simply don't have uh, the same amount of processing uh, capacity that you did pre-COVID. Uh, so you probably are going to continue to see ground beef prices and beef generally uh, remain elevated as we move uh, into the back half of the year and into 2024. Another item that was all over the headlines, baby formula. Yes. How, and, what's and the this, latest with that? Uh, the latest with that is that you would think that you, once you got production up and running, you would reduce prices. I mean, it's a political hotball. Um, so I don't really understand why we haven't seen these prices come down. And they are actually looks pretty sticky here when it when it comes to the pricing uh, potential. It used to be somewhat cyclical. Um, you know, when you had you know, more children being born, you had baby formula prices higher and then you would cycle down. Uh, what's interesting is during COVID, we had anything but a baby boom. Uh, the United States, you know, is sitting at multi decade lows in terms of the number of births. So this is a this is a pretty strange one. And if this can hold higher. I think it's it's indicative of underlying price pressures that are fairly persistent in the system. Another large piece of the inflation puzzle is housing. Existing home sales continue to dominate even in this very high interest environment. What's the latest with new homes and home builders? Yeah, so this, this dynamic is crazy. Uh, existing home sales dominate the number of homes that are sold in the United States and the number of homes that are put up for sale. Uh, so not only is it indicative of what's going on in terms of home sales, it's also indicative of what's going on in terms of inventory being put out there uh, by individuals. And the, uh, we call it the bad side for housing is that, you know, people who have low mortgage rates, guess what? They don't really want to give up their two and a half to 3% mortgage rate to go buy, uh, you know, to put their home up for sale and go buy a house at a six and a half to seven percent mortgage rate. You know, that's just they don't want to do that. And it makes sense. Uh, but those people who have significant, uh, call it, you know, want to buy a home are buying new homes. And, you know, it's been a boon for the home builders. If you look at any of the home builders uh, quarterly reports, they're doing very well in this environment. They're doing very well because it's low inventory. And if you want to buy a home, you look at it and say, well, I guess I can pay a six 
six and a half, seven percent mortgage rate for a little while, and then I'll just refinance when interest rates go back down. So you are seeing new home sales actually accelerate, um, and you know, existing home sales uh, absolutely collapse. So I think it's this dynamic is one to pay attention to, and it's really intriguing when it comes to call it the perceived profitability of the home builders versus how well they're actually doing. Sam, in summary today, what should we be watching for next in this inflationary environment? I, I think we really need to be looking at how easy the past six months of disinflation have really been, right? These, this was the low hanging fruit uh, disinflation and the rest of the story is just how sticky inflation may be going forward as we begin to shift into a really a services driven type economy. Uh, in a services driven type inflation, it's a lot stickier than simply freight rates and things of that nature. So I think it's really worth paying attention to as we go forward, how the easy is behind us and the difficulties ahead. Sam, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our audience. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianca Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day, everyone.